Hi, Quilty friends. Welcome back to another Quilting Classroom with me, Stuart Hillard, and brought to you by Aki Quilt and Create and Craft TV. Now, if you don't already subscribe to our YouTube channel, make sure you do, because you wouldn't want to miss a video, and we will give you advanced notice when we put new videos up. And they come out all the time, so you wouldn't want to miss them. Now, in today's Quilting Classroom, we're going to be using a brand new die called Sea Life Medley, and we're going to be using your cube and companion angles to make a great quilt called Storm at Sea. It's a real classic block, and it's one that I'm asked for all the time. You may not have realised that you already had all of the dies needed to make this classic block. But in today's show, I'm going to be showing you how to make that block, how to piece it, how to put it together, and how to add some really fun applique details using the new Sea Life Medley die. Let's have a quick look at that Sea Life Medley die, because it's an absolute corker. You're gonna love it. Um, it'll go through all machines, which is wonderful news. So whether you have the Go Me, the Go Baby, the Go, or the Go Big, you can use this die. You'll need a six by 12 cutting mat, um, and it cuts five different shapes. You might only see four uh, when you look at the packaging, but there are five, I promise. We've got the crab right at the top, um, and then we've got the fish, tropical fish. We've got the seahorse, and we've got a starfish. But what you might not see straight away is that you've also got a little circle right here that you can use for the eye or a scale or scales or also maybe air bubbles. So really useful and who likes cutting out circles unless you've got an Accu quilt. So you've got those five great shapes and this is gonna be perfect for adding embellishments to things like quilts and cushions, pillows, maybe a beach bag, that would be really fun, clothing, accessories, you name it. Now we're also gonna be needing our cube and it doesn't matter what size cube you have, you can still make the Storm at Sea block using your cube. And you're also gonna need the companion angles in the same size as your cube. So if you don't already have the cube or the angles companion, have a look in the description box that goes along with this video and you'll be able to order those additional dies so that you can make this great block and plenty more besides. So I think it's a really good idea right now to have a little look at the Storm at Sea block, our base block, and see what we're gonna to need to piece in order to make this quilt. So I've got my Storm at Sea block set out in front of me right here on the table and it's made up of a number of different elements. Now to start with, I'm gonna separate out the elements so that you can see perhaps a little bit more clearly what we're going to make. Now, if you've made quilt blocks before, you might well be familiar with the idea of having a block that's then surrounded by sashing and cornerstones. If not, let me explain what I mean. Quite often when we make a quilt, we'll make the block, it might be a star block, it might be a log cabin, it might be a square in a square. And then rather than joining block to block to block, we put some kind of frame around it. Now quite often in quilts, this frame, which we call sashing, is just plain strips of fabric and you could use your strip dies for that and they look great. Um, it's a great way of highlighting a quilt block, making it stand out, and also, let's be honest, it makes our quilt grow that little bit faster without having to do a ton of piecing. Now in the Storm at Sea block, the sashing is actually pieced sashing, and it is integral to the block, but it's not actually a part of the block itself. It's part of a sashing that goes around the center, and that's these, diamond shapes right here, which I'm gonna show you how to piece. So these are our pieced sashings. And then at the intersections of those sashings at the corners, we have what are called cornerstones. Now again, in a usual sashed quilt, these are often um, plain squares of fabric, um, but you can put pieced cornerstones into your quilt and they look great too. And in our Storm at Sea block, again, Pieced cornerstones are integral to the whole design, and they are these four units right here. So I'm gonna show you how to make all these elements, and then the whole thing gets sewn together, and that's your storm at sea. 
It's really easy and fun. Um, don't be put off by some of the slightly more unusual shapes in there, particularly if you're a beginner quilter. It's a great next step once you've mastered things like half square triangles and flying geese. So um, the first unit that we're gonna piece is that center block right here. And this is a square in a square in a square. Um, sometimes this block's called economy because it's a great way of using up your scraps and being economical. So this on its own would be really lovely as a scrap quilt, just lots of blocks like this. And I always like to give you an extra pattern if I possibly can. Now, even though that center unit looks like the square on point from your cube, it's actually not made using dies five and six, which you might have expected if you're familiar with the cube. Um, we're going to use die number one for the very center. That's our large square. We're going to use die number four, which is our flying geese or quarter square triangles for the white triangles. And then we're going to use die number three from our cube, the large half square triangle for these corners of the block. So that's how we're going to cut out our center block. For our cornerstones, these are our actual square on point units from our cube. So these are ones that you perhaps have made before. Die number six for that center square on point, and then die number five for the triangles that we're gonna use in the corners, okay? So those are all the elements that we're gonna use our cube for. Now I'm gonna start by cutting and piecing those and then we'll talk about using the companion angles for those last pieced sashings. So I'm ready to start cutting. I'm using my Go Big today, um, but remember these uh, new dies are compatible with all machines. So if you've got a Go Me or a Go Baby, you can still make this quilt. So I've got die number six, which is the square on point, and I'm going to um, just piece one unit for now. Um, you'll need more for your quilt, and you can refer to the free quilt pattern that comes with this quilting classroom uh, to get all of your quantities. Um, but I'm just going to cut one layer. So I'm using white for the center of my uh, square on point, so we'll pop the fabric on. Make sure it's on the lengthwise grain running through the length of your machine and we'll send that through. I've also got die number five and I'm going to cut some small half square triangles. I need four of those per unit. So I'm just going to carefully fan fold my fabric and lay it on. I'm not going to waste a scrap here. I'm really using the smallest piece I can get away with and we'll send that through too. Okay, smashing. So I've got my, see, look at that. And that's a tiny little bit of, don't need that. So I've got my four half square triangles cut out and I've also got my square on point cut out. So I'm gonna put those units together, ready for piecing. And while I'm here, I'm also going to cut a few other elements. So I've got right here, die number one, which is my large square. And that's going to be the very, very center of my Storm at Sea block. And that's what the applique element is going to sit on top of. So you might want to think about that when you're planning out your colors, make sure that you've got some good contrast between square number one, that's the very center, and your chosen appliques, your starfish, your seahorse, whatever is going on there. So again, on the lengthwise grain running through the length of the machine. And that's all cut. And again, I'll pop that to one side for piecing. Now then, I've also got, this is die number four, which is quarter square triangle. I always think of this as the flying geese die. And I want four of these. So again, just one layer of fabric and one cut, and that's enough for one whole block. So that can go through. And then last of all, I've got die number three, which is large half square triangles. 
and I need four of those. The die cut's two, so I've got two layers of fabric and we'll run that through. There's my flying geese all cut. And don't forget on all of your triangles, things like your dog ears are all clipped off ready, so there's no trimming to do later on. Just makes things so much quicker and so much easier. Okay, so I've got all of the parts that I need for the very center of my block and my cornerstones cut out. I'm going to leave those to one side. And the next thing that I need to do is to set those pieces out on my table next to the sewing machine to make sure that I've got all the bits in the right places and that I'm happy with the color arrangement. So join me back over here and we'll have a look at that. Okay, so always a good idea to set out your pieces of fabric in front of you before you sew them together. Certainly for the first block or two, just to get you into that groove, making sure you're putting the right fabrics in the right place. Once you've done that, if you're making the big quilt and you need to make 49 of these blocks, great, go ahead, start chain piecing. But for the first couple of blocks, I always recommend that you set the pieces out on the table in front of you so that you know exactly what you're doing. So right in the center, I've got that blue square that I cut out using die number one and my applique will sit on top of that. Next thing I cut four quarter square triangles or, or flying geese in white. And you can mix up the colors, of course. You don't have to use exactly the same colors as me. But it is quite a good idea to put the lights and the darks where I've put the lights and the darks. So you get that optical illusion that we're so familiar with in the storm at sea. So those are my next four triangles and I've set them around to create that square on point or that square in a square. And now we need to add the final square, which is using die number three, those large half square triangles and they complete the block and make the four corners. And you can see there how you could use a bunch of scraps or maybe you've got some layer cake squares hanging around. Um, you could make a really lovely quilt just using that block um, and that would look absolutely super. Um, this is gonna be really easy to sew together, but there's an order to it. So let's get to the sewing. I'm just going to shuffle across a little bit and then I'm ready to sew. Now we're always going to start from the center and work outwards. So I've got my center square in blue and what I'm going to do is I'm going to sew on two quarter square triangles to opposite sides. Okay, so work on opposite sides here rather than two adjacent sides. It's just going to be so much easier with piecing and pressing. So flip right sides together so that that first quarter square triangle is lined up beautifully. And because the dog ears are clipped off at either end, you should find that your two ends match up perfectly without even trying. It's one of the benefits of using AccuQuilt. The dog ears are clipped off, the shapes are perfectly cut, and everything just lines up beautifully. Now I'm using a quarter of an inch seam allowance. Always worth testing your quarter of an inch seam allowance before you start sewing as well, before you start making a block. And I'm gonna stitch straight across. First one done. Cut your threads and then we don't need to start pressing back because we're adding opposite sides here. So this is a little bit sort of time efficient doing it this way. So again, line up your edges, your start and your finish. And the point of that quarter square triangle will naturally sit in the middle. You don't have to think about that. You don't have to worry about measuring or anything like that. It's just going to naturally sit right in the dead center. Okay, so those two seams are now sewn. So my next step is gonna be just to set my seams. Just use a, an iron on a cotton setting. 
just to shrink down the stitching a little bit, just tightens up the stitching, makes for a much better press. And then I'm going to flip those triangles back and I actually love to finger press when I'm making my patchwork. So I will work from the center outwards and I will just push that seam outwards. It's really telling the fabric where it needs to go before I get near the iron. So once I've pushed those elements back, I can go to my iron and give it a nice press. And make sure that you are using a pressing action when you're uh, making patchwork, rather than vigorous sort of ironing back and forth. Just use quite a firm downward pressure and you'll get a lot less distortion. Okay, so those two elements are stitched on. I can sew the remaining two triangles on. And again, they fit beautifully. Line them up. Quarter inch seam allowance again. So straight back under the machine and we'll stitch. Now you'll see here I'm not using pins. On a short run like this, I can hold it in place with my fingers, but if you prefer to pin, then you absolutely can. Trim your threads as you go, so you don't have to do a big sort of clean up at the end. And we'll sew the last white triangle on. So this is a sort of classic square on point at this point, um, but not using your square on point dies from your cube. Confused? You will be. <laughs> okay, so we'll just quickly set those seams and finger press them back. I think the point I'm making there is that your dies can do so much more than, than you first think. I mean, every time I get my cube out, I discover something new that I can do with it that I didn't realize before. And, you know, I love using the patterns that come with my cube, um, but they're a great starting point. If you've got time to experiment and you've got some scraps, it is so worth just, uh, you know, cutting a load of shapes and seeing what you come up with. Okay, so there's my first square on point all stitched and pressed. Everything's beautifully square. I'm really happy with that. So last thing to do is to add on the remaining four triangles. And I'm gonna do that in exactly the same way. I'm gonna sew on opposite sides and then finger press and then use my iron to press. Okay, here goes. Whenever I'm sewing triangles, I'm always conscious that a sewing machine can gobble up the first bit of fabric. And it's really because there's very little fabric in contact with your feed dogs, those teeth that carry um, the fabric through the machine. And one little trick that you will see me use all the time is I just either hold on to the threads as I'm taking those first few stitches, or I'll actually grab onto them. And as I take my first couple of stitches, I will pull back just gently on the threads. And that just guides the fabric through the teeth, through the feed dogs, just for the first couple of stitches. And never have problems then with my machine gobbling up fabric. Okay, first two triangles all sewn on. So again, set your seams. When you're thinking about setting up your sewing area at home, try to think about efficiency. And, um, you know, I think it's important to minimize the number of times I have to get up and physically walk to an ironing board and iron and walk back. Um, not because I'm lazy, but because I'm, when I sit down to sew, I want to sew. I don't want to keep walking. Um, I'll go for a walk in the country if I want to walk. Um, I want to be able to do things as efficiently as I can. So setting up a little ironing surface next to your sewing machine just makes the whole process a lot more efficient. So those are pressed back. And now my last two triangles go on and they fit beautifully. If there's ever a time when you're adding triangles and they don't fit beautifully, there's several explanations. One could be that you've cut the wrong shape. Okay, um, there's lots of different triangle dies and maybe you picked the wrong one. So check which die you're using first of all. The second thing that could have happened is that 
um, you've used a seam allowance which is either too big or too small. And because of this, your piece that you're adding doesn't quite fit. That's a warning sign. It's telling you to go back and check your seam allowance and potentially make it slightly bigger or slightly smaller. Another good reason for making a test block before you start making the big quilt. And the last thing is simply that, you know, you haven't maybe pressed your block as flat as you could. Um, maybe you need to go back and give it another little iron. And finally, there we go. We'll set those seams and finger press back. And it makes my heart glad when I make a block like this and all of the points that should be nice and sharp are. <laughs> it wasn't always that way. And I think certainly when I relied on rotary cutting in templates, it was always a little bit like Russian roulette. Sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But with AccuQuilt, I know I'm always going to get a perfect cut and a perfect result every time. So there's my center square in a square in a square, all pieced, all pressed and I'm ready to move on to my cornerstones. So let's look at that section next. I'll pop this to one side. Now I've already got these pieces cut. I've got my center square on point. This is using die number six. And then I've got four small half square triangles using die number five which I'm going to sew all the way around. I'm going to use exactly the same process as I did for the center of the block. Two opposite sides first, sew, press, and then I'm going to add the last two. And for your Storm at Sea block, to go around one center, you're going to need four of those cornerstones. But on my sample that we had a look at right at the start of this show, um, the next square in a square in a square, go straight onto that sashing. So if you like two blocks, share the same piece sashing. Um, so keep that in mind when you're planning out your quilt. If you're making the quilt that I'm showing you today, just follow the instructions. Um, but if you're making a different kind of storm at sea, you can have piece sashings between every block. So two lots of sashings will meet. And that looks great too. And that's what we've got on the quilt behind me that's done in beautiful purple batiks. That's got that piece sashing in between every block. Um, so there are lots of different variations. Um, but just make sure you look at that and decide what pattern you're making before you cut out all your pieces so you know how many to cut. Right, let's piece this square on point. It's really, really easy now to do this. Once you've made one of them, you'll be cooking with gas, as we say. So again, we're using that quarter of an inch seam allowance. Just make sure your fabric stays nice and flat under the presser foot as you sew. There's one side. Don't worry about pushing that fabric back at this point. We're working on two opposite sides, so we don't have to. Okay. All right, there's the two sides done. We'll just give that a little set. I don't tend to use steam when I'm pressing, but if a block's not behaving itself or not sitting as flat as I'd like it to, sometimes give it a little blast of steam. So those are pressed back now. I'll give them one more press. And then I'll add my two remaining small half square triangles. And again, they're fitting beautifully, which tells me that I'm using the right size seam allowance and the right triangles. So again, we'll stitch across. And then we'll add the last one. Now you're going to make four of these units. But I'm just going to make one here. <laughs> 
And in fact, if you're making a bigger quilt, you'll make a lot more. But you could just make one storm at sea block for, say, a cushion. And that would be a great way of testing the pattern out and seeing if you enjoy it. It would also make a brilliant bag front. So if you wanted to make maybe a tote bag for the beach, that would look really good too. I just hope when you get to the beach, there isn't a storm at sea. I'm sure they'll insert laughter there when they edit the video. Okay, there we go. Last little bit of pressing. And there we go. There's my pieced cornerstone ready to go into the quilt. Okay, so that's all of the elements stitched together using your cube. But we've got some pieced sashing to make as well. And this is where we need to use our companion angles. And we're going to use dies 13 and 15. And they're the uh, half rectangle triangles and the pyramid shape, or the, the large sort of triangle in a square centre. And you'll find those um, in your companion angles. They are such a useful unit. Um, they appear in many, many blocks. Um, so in one of the other videos, we made a 5440 or fight uh, block, and that was also using these elements. So you might have already had a go at that. Um, we also use those elements for the storm at sea. Mm -hmm. For one big block with four lots of sashings, we're going to need to cut and piece eight of these triangle in a square units. So I've got two here, and then when we've pieced those, we'll stitch them together in pairs to create a diamond in a rectangle. Now, I actually think that diamond in a rectangle would make a fantastic quilt all on its own. Just lots of these super scrappy, maybe using reproduction fabrics or batiks or something really bright, maybe with black or charcoal background, would look gorgeous. Um, but they pop up in so many quilt blocks um, and, and often quilt blocks that we've avoided because they look a bit hard to rotary cut and they're not quite as easy as just cutting strips. But remember, with your AccuQuilt, Anything is as easy to cut as anything else. Um, suddenly, there's a whole new world of cutting and piecing options open to you. So let's get these pieces cut out and we can make the last bit of our block. Okay, so let's cut the last elements of our Storm at Sea block. And these are our triangles in a square unit used in so many different quilt blocks. So first of all, I've got die number 13. And that's my, I always call it the tall triangle or the pyramid shape. And this is the triangle that's in the center of that square. Um, now this is the part that when we've stitched two together, this will be the part that creates the diamond. And in my quilt, I'm using dark fabric for this element and then light fabric for the triangles that will complete the square, okay? But you could switch that up it's always a nice idea actually to, to draw these blocks out maybe with squared paper and colour them in with coloured pencils just so that you get an idea of how your quilt's going to go together and maybe cut your pieces of fabric out but don't sew them together. Arrange them on the table, take some photographs, make sure that you're happy with your placement of your fabrics. So I always feel once I've sewn my fabrics together, I've committed and it's got to go in the quilt there. And, and sometimes I'm not always as happy about the color choices that I've made. If I plan everything out and set it out before I sew a stitch, if there's a fabric in there I don't like, I can wake it out and, um, and replace it with something else. Okay, so I'm going to make two of these units right now. So I've got two layers of fabric and I'm going to cover the shape. Make sure that the fabric is on the lengthwise grain going through the length of your machine. And make sure that where you've got a straight edge like this on the shape, it won't be straight on the die, but you want your fabric to be straight with the shape that you're cutting. Okay, so I'll place my fabric on top. And then I've got my second piece of fabric here. I'm just using scraps up, but you could fan fold your fabric and cut up to six layers. And then we'll run that through the go big. While that's cutting, I'm going to grab my other die, and this is die number 14. 
and this is my half rectangle triangles and um, I'm going to need to cut out four of these. The die cuts two so I'm going to put two layers of fabric on top and again run that through. Yeah, okay, so I've got my half rectangle triangles cut out and I've also got my tall triangle centers. So now we can get to laying them out on the table and then sewing them together. So I always like to set out my pieces on the table in front of me before I start sewing them together. It's just a nice visual reminder of what I'm going to do. I get easily confused. So I've got my two units right here and then I've got my newly cut fabrics right here. So I'm going to set them out. Okay, great. Now with your half rectangle triangles, your die is actually going to cut out a left and a right version. Um, and you can't substitute. So you're going to get a left and a right, which is fine because we need a left and a right one for either side of the tall triangle in the center. Um, but if you're using, say, fabric which is, I don't know, maybe directional or patterned on one side and plain on the other, just make sure you're picking up the right piece when you set them out. So if we take one of each as we cut them, and this will make either side on one, and then the next two pieces will make the remaining two sides. So you'll need to always cut two layers. There we go. All right. So I've got my half rectangle triangles around the triangle in the center. And the next thing I can do is sew that together. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move those two triangles out of the way because I'm actually going to do a little bit of chain piecing here just to speed the process up slightly. And it's something I do all the time. So I'm going to flip my first triangle over. And even though if I was rotary cutting or using a template, I would feel slightly nervous about doing a shape like this. With Aki Quilt, everything is so precisely cut and everything lines up beautifully. All I need to do is make sure that I don't play with the pieces of fabric because, you know, we've got a long bias edge along the side of that half rectangle triangle and it could easily stretch. So, you know, once you've cut your pieces, kind of just leave them in a stack until you're ready to piece them. And then when you do piece them, just be quite gentle with them. If you're nervous about doing that, one thing you can do just to make your pieces slightly more robust is to spray the fabric with some spray starch, laundry starch, and press the fabric before you start cutting your pieces. That will just make the fabric feel a bit firmer and um, a bit less likely to stretch. Um, I don't bother, to be honest with you. Um, I don't find it necessary. But if you like a little insurance policy, you can do that. But you certainly don't need to make the fabric stiff in order to cut it. Okay, so I've got my other half rectangle triangle now. So I haven't bothered cutting the thread. I've just lifted the presser foot up, put my next patches underneath, and I'm just gonna keep on sewing. So if I had 50 of these units to make, I would just keep sewing all 50 units on one side and I would end up with a great long sort of line of bunting like this. Um, and then you just clip the elements apart, just on that thread that's holding them together. And then you can go to your ironing surface, set your seam. And there we go. And again, use that nice pressing movement rather than vigorous sort of ironing back and forth and then back onto a nice flat surface like your table and then working from the center out just push that seam allowance back using your fingernail and I'm going to do the same here just to finger press your patches in shape. I just find that when I then go back to my ironing surface 
I get a much flatter surface and my seam stays nice and straight. It's worked very well for me for many, many years. Okay, once I've done that, I'm just gonna place my units back on the table and line them up with the remaining two triangles. And now I know exactly what I'm sewing next. So this is just my way of keeping myself nicely organized when I'm doing my piecing. Now these half rectangle triangles can be sewn together um, just as they are, maybe one light, one dark. Um, that would make a great scrap quilt. Uh, you can also use your triangle in a square center on its own, pieced together with others. I mean, there's so much you can do if you experiment. And they are great scrap busters. So I've got my last units here to sew together. So I'm gonna line up those long edges, being really careful with that bias edge, lift and lower the presser foot, and then just keep sewing. Make sure your fabric stays nice and flat underneath your presser foot as you're sewing. Okay, that's the last one done. I'll clip my threads and then just cut that thread that joins the two patches. Set my seam on both units and then finger press and give a final press to the unit. Now I'm pressing my seams outwards towards the light fabric. Um, this is quite an opaque white fabric, so there isn't really any show through. You could press your seams towards the triangle in the center or the dark fabric. You could even press your seams open. Um, it's really what you feel comfortable with. We always used to say not to press seams open in patchwork because it made it more likely that the batting in our quilt would what's called beard. I'm not talking about this kind of beard, but um, the little bits of batting would sort of pop up through the open seams and you'd get little bits of fluff appearing through your quilt. Nowadays, quilt battings, um, the construction of them, the manufacture of them is, is much better and they're much less likely to beard. So if you like pressing your seams open, go for it. Okay, so I've made my two units now and they're all nicely pressed. And the last thing that I need to do to finish off this unit is just to sew these two triangle and square units together to create a diamond in a rectangle. So again, set them, self, set them out on the table in front of you um, before you sew. And that's just to avoid doing this, for example, although that would look lovely, but it wouldn't do much for a storm at C block. Um, but there's lots of different ways you could set these units. Um, you could actually, see now I want to experiment. <laughs> you could set them together like that. I mean, how cool does that look? And that's using those triangles in a square as well. And that would make a fabulous um, eight inch finished block. Don't forget I'm using the eight inch cube here. So, um, so much you can do. Um, but we're gonna sew these two units together. So, right sides together. Now I'm gonna knock myself out here and use a couple of pins, because I don't want the end to move and I don't wanna lose my point. So I'll just pop a couple of pins in there just to hold everything in place. And we're gonna sew this. Now one little tip, when you're making a unit for the first time and you've got units that you want to match up beautifully, um, no one likes them picking, am I right? So what I like to do is I will set my sewing machine to stitch the longest stitch that it will do. And then on really important seams, I will machine baste them. So I'm just using that longest stitch length and I'm gonna sew straight across, taking my pins out as I get to them. I'd only do this on the first couple of units. Once I've made a first, uh, first few units and I know everything's lining up, I'll just sew everything with a normal stitch length um, right the way through. But the reason why I'm doing this is just to make sure that once I've sewn that unit together, I've got really nice points on my diamond. And if I'm not happy with it, it's really quick and easy just to whip that basting out. But if I'm happy with the way everything looks, and I am, 
I'll set my stitch length back to a normal stitch length and then I'll re-sew the seam. So it's just a little insurance policy and it helps to avoid the grim ripper, as we call it. Um, nobody likes unpicking a seam, least of all me. Okay, now on this unit, I do like to press these seam allowances open um, because you've got a number of different seams all coming together in one spot. So I'm just going to push my seam allowance open and I'll just show you on the table how I do that. I just go with my fingers and again from the from the center out, yeah I'm being quite firm and I'm just going to push that seam allowance open. And it really does make the job so much easier because then I can go to my ironing surface and then I can just literally clamp down with that iron and press that seam open. You really can avoid that wobble in your seam allowances. And then you get perfectly pressed open seam allowance. My unit's gonna lie beautifully flat. And then when I set my block out, Let's grab the units and then I can set my block out and sew it together. Now sewing blocks together we've covered in previous lessons so I'm not going to sew this unit together but just so that you don't have to go back and reference a previous video, what you're gonna to do to make one complete Storm at Sea block here is once you've sewn your diamond in a rectangle unit sashing together, you're going to lay them all out in a block like this and then you will sew this together as a unit. So square on point, diamond in a rectangle, square on point, sew those together and press these seam allowances outwards. Then you're going to sew diamond in a rectangle sashing to the center, to one more diamond in a rectangle and press those seam allowances inwards. And then you're going to make one more sashing down the bottom and again you'll press those seam allowances outwards. And then you can sew those three layers together and you will end up with one large storm at sea block. So that's how we're going to make our base block for our quilt and you can use that for all kinds of different quilts. There are loads of different ways you can put this together and especially if you start experimenting with colour um, you can have great fun with the storm at sea and I love the way it has an illusion of curves running through it and that's because of these diamond in a rectangle units that sort of link up with other parts of the block. But what I want to do before I sew my units together is I actually want to put my applique onto that center block. I'm going to find it much easier turning a small block like this under my sewing machine to applique a patch in the center or a, a character in the center than if I was working on a really big block or even a quilt top. So it makes sense for me to do the applique now. Um, you could do it on a bigger piece if you want to but I think it's easier to do it right now. So that's what we're gonna do next. And for that, I'm gonna need my Sea Life Medley die. So this is one of our brand new dies, and this has five elements on it. We've got the crab, the fish, the seahorse and the starfish, and the little eye or a water bubble or air bubble. Um, so I'm going to cut out and I'm actually going to cut out a couple of starfish um, to applique on the center of this block. So let's do that next. Okay, so if you've never done fusible applique before, you're going to need some of this stuff. This is fusible web. Um, there's lots of different brand names. I like to use Vlizofix or Bonda web. It has a paper backing, which is a little bit like baking parchment. And then on one side, you'll feel, rather than see, a sort of rough layer. And that's like a very fine mesh or web of glue that's been sprayed onto the paper and then dried. So it creates a little mesh of glue which can be bonded to fabric and then that fabric can be bonded to something else. And that's how we do fusible applique. 
It's important to make sure that you know which side is which and the smooth side is your paper and the rough side is the glue. So it's an easy way to, to check and make sure because you don't want to get this stuff on your iron or glued to your ironing board. And you're just going to cut out some rough squares or rectangles or whatever you need big enough slightly bigger than the shape you want to applique. You'll cut that out with some scissors and then you're going to lay the glue side, that rough side, down onto the wrong side of your fabric. So the glue side, the rough side, goes down on the wrong side of your fabric and then you're going to iron that in place. And it just takes a few seconds. I always like to have a piece of fabric which is slightly bigger than the fusible web and that's just to make sure that no bits of fusible web get onto my ironing board because they're going to create a little sticky patch and ruin my ironing board. We don't like that. The next important step is that you leave your fabric to go cold. While that bonded um, glue is still even warm, it's not going to be completely adhered to the fabric. And if you start cutting and peeling paper off, there's a danger that you'll peel the fusible web off too. And that's really, you know, defeating the object of the whole exercise. So let your fabric go completely cold. It's also, you know, um, not a good idea to pick up the fabric when it's really, really hot. Because you've got that hot glue on there as well, which isn't really hot. But, you know, I mean, why take the risk? Okay, so I've got my uh, die here, and again, this is compatible with all machines. I just want to cut out the starfish, but I want to cut two of them. And um, you can lay your fabric right side up or right side down. If you lay your fabric right side up, you're going to get whatever image you see here, you'll get exactly that image in fabric. If you lay your fabric wrong side facing up, then your seahorse would be facing the other way once you turn him over. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't really matter with the starfish. So um, I'm going to put my fabrics right side up and I'm just going to layer them on top and I'm going to do two layers. So I'll pop my orange down first of all and I'm just making sure that the bonder web and the fabric completely cover the shape that I want to cut. And then I'm going to use my 6 by 12 cutting mat, lay that on top and run that through the machine. Now if you're cutting just fabric, quilt weight cotton fabric, you can cut up to six layers. But once you add a layer of bonder web, you want to count that bonder web or fusible web as a half layer. In other words, you can cut up to four layers of bonded fabric. So once we've done that, we can lift the fabric away and what's left, we've got perfectly cut starfish and they're ready to go onto my background Storm at Sea block. Now at the moment they've still got the paper attached to them, so I need to remove that next and I'm just going to show you a quick trick to do that. Now I just need to grab a pen and what I'm going to do is I'm going to scratch carefully a little X, sort of X marks the spot on the back of my starfish on the paper. A lot of people try and lift up the edge of the paper right from the very edge. It's really hard to do. And also there's a danger that you'll start sort of fraying the fabric. But if you make a little cross in the centre, then you can just lift that paper up really easily and just pull it so cleanly off the shape. It doesn't distort the fabric shape at all. And you'll see there's no frayed edges around the starfish at all. It looks great. And I'm going to do exactly the same with my second starfish. Now I've done two because I want to layer them up a little bit. Um, when I applique them. So I've done one in orange and one in yellow. Okay, so I've still got my block all set out, which is a good idea because that's going to help me with placement. And I think I'm going to put the darker starfish maybe there and the lighter starfish just down there. 
I think that looks quite cute. This would make a really nice beach bag, I think, um, for when I'm heading to Scarborough with my novel and my suntan lotion and my windbreak. <laughs> okay, don't forget the windbreak. So the next step is to fuse those shapes down onto the background block. So simple, we're just gonna take the whole block to the ironing surface. Just try not to cough or sneeze when you're doing this, otherwise your pieces will go everywhere. And then again, a pressing motion, you're just gonna put your iron straight down, okay? And almost instantly, those shapes are gonna fuse but they will fuse better if you just spend a few seconds just pressing and moving that iron, but don't rub the iron back and forth. Because if, for example, one of the arms or tentacles on the um, starfish hadn't quite bonded down and you start rubbing the iron back and forth, you could flip that over and end up fusing it to the bottom of your iron. Did you know that a starfish's eyes are actually on the ends of its arms. Imagine if human beings were like that. <laughs> okay, so those starfish are all fused down. I'm really happy with the placement of those. I think they look great and they really add a fun element. The last thing that I need to do is just to applique those shapes down onto the background and for that I need to go to my sewing machine. Okay, so I'm back at my sewing machine, ready to do some machine applique. Three things need to change on our sewing machine in order for us to do that. The first thing is I'm going to change the foot on my machine. I've been using a quarter of an inch foot for my patchwork, but for applique I need to use an open-toed embroidery foot. And let me just show you what that means. So if you have a look at the foot, first of all the open-toed part I think is fairly obvious. Um, the foot is open at the front and that gives me a really clear view of the needle and also the edge of the applique. And when I'm appliqueing, I want to get my stitching over that edge really quite precisely. So the more I can do to make a better view, the better. So um, an open-toed embroidery foot works. The other thing that you might not have ever noticed about this foot is if you look at the underside of the foot, you'll notice that there is a channel cut into the bottom of that foot. And that's to allow the foot to glide over the top of perhaps slightly thicker um, stitching. So if you're using something like a satin stitch or a bulky buttonhole stitch, that cutaway will allow the foot to glide over the top of it. So an open-toed embroidery foot really useful for this task. So that's the first thing that's changed. The second thing that's changed is my thread. I've changed the thread on the top. I've kept my neutral thread in the bobbin, but on the top I'm using what's called monofilament or invisible thread. It's quite difficult to see at home um, being invisible, but it's a really clear, very, very fine, clear thread that is almost invisible when you stitch with it. Some people use it for quilting, lots of us use it for machine applique because it provides a very sort of neat, very unobtrusive edge to applique, but holds everything down very nicely. You could use a contrasting or a toning cotton or polyester thread. So on my um, starfish, I could use matching orange and yellow thread for the top, and that would look lovely too. Um, but you would want to make sure that your sewing was really neat and really precise and if you're a beginner why not give yourself a little advantage and use invisible thread that isn't really going to show very much and then it doesn't matter if you wobble a little bit. There I've said it. <laughs> um, then the third thing that has changed is the stitch that I'm going to use. I've been using a straight stitch and now for machine applique I'm going to use a narrow zigzag. Now pretty much every sewing machine has a zigzag stitch. Um, you want it just a little bit narrower than normal. Uh, mine is set on about 2.5. The default is about 3, 3.2, something like that. So you just want it slightly narrower. But the thing to do is grab a scrap of fabric, experiment, and get a size which looks good to you. There's no hard and fast rules. But you could also use a straight stitch for appliqueing, you could use a blanket stitch, or you could even experiment with some of the decorative stitches on your sewing machine, particularly if you were using thread 
that is meant to show. Use a decorative stitch um, and let's get started. Now, whenever I'm doing machine applique, one of the things I look for is a continuous path. It just minimizes the number of starts and finishes that I have to deal with. So on my starfish, if I start at this point here, I can go all the way around the orange starfish and finish here. And then I can go all the way around the yellow starfish and finish here. And I'm done in one continuous path. Makes life a lot easier. So here we go. So I'm going to start just with one little zigzag and then I'm going to put my needle back down and then I'm just going to change to a straight stitch, a nice short straight stitch and then I'm going to stitch on the spot just for a couple of stitches. That's just to secure my thread. And then I'm going to go back to the zigzag and then I'm going to carry on zigzagging around the starfish. Pivoting my fabric wherever I need to. Now when you're using invisible thread, it really doesn't matter if you wobble a little bit or go a little bit off the shape. It's very, very forgiving. And I think certainly for most of us, having a technique which allows for a little bit of natural wobble can only be a good thing. There we go. Now I'm taking this nice and slow. There's no need to rush. And this zigzag is just making sure that the raw edges of my fabric are held down nice and securely. And it just makes my whole project that bit more robust. If I was doing this for a wall hanging that wasn't likely to get washed, I might only use a straight stitch around the appliques, be faster and easier. But if I was gonna use this for a tote bag or maybe a bed quilt, I would definitely want to make sure that the appliques were stitched down really securely so that the, the quilt could go through the machine, the washing machine, and those gorgeous appliques are not going to lift up. Okay, so I'm almost all the way around my first starfish. I think I read somewhere once as well that starfish don't always have five arms. Um, you can get ones, I think, with up to 10. I don't think I've made that up. I might have made it up. I mean, I do that, but um, I think I read somewhere once that you can get up to 10 tentacles on a starfish. But ours come with five, which I think is the mo more usual. Okay, now of course you could, if you wanted to make these look a little bit more um, maybe child friendly or um, more comical, you could of course put some little eyes on. You could even embroider a little mouth. That would be very finding what's his name, wouldn't it? <laughs> and keep going around the legs of the starfish. You know, all of the shapes on the uh, sea medley are just as easy to stitch around. Akiko, always think about the person who's got to stitch around these shapes. So there aren't too many complicated ins and outs for you to try and get round. Which just means the whole process is a lot more fun and a lot more enjoyable. Okay, last little bit. And we're on the home run. Okay, so I'm just coming up to where I started and just to secure my thread, I'm gonna go back to that straight stitch and I'm just going to do about five or six tiny straight stitches just to secure my thread. And I'll lift the whole thing out 
and I will clip the thread. Just make sure with, particularly with monofilament, that when you clip your threads, you put them straight in the bin, particularly if you've got pets or children, because the thread's not the kind of thing that you want kind of lying on the floor and getting gobbled up by one of your pets. It's also really good to be neat, isn't it? And that's it, they are stitched down. And I think you'll agree that that invisible thread makes a really good finish to the edges. It's really nice and secure. Um, I've wobbled, I have wobbled, um, but you really can't see where I've wobbled. And if I turn this block around so you can see it from the back, you can see the zigzag stitching and that's now done. And I can put that into my block and stitch the whole thing together to make my quilt. Now don't forget that the whole free pattern is available to download from the Create and Craft website. And um, it's completely free to do that. You can print it off as many times as you like. So print it off for your friends and for people at the Guild and whoever you like to stitch with and share the Aki Quilt love and um, share your love of craft with them. Um, just to finish off my quilt, uh, all I've done is added a border and cornerstones around the outside. And I've used my one and a half inch strip die to do that. But you could put a two and a half inch border or a bigger border if you wanted. Maybe a four inch border would look fantastic. And then you could add some more applique elements, uh, some more starfish, some more seahorses around the border of your quilt too. So I hope you'll have a lot of fun with this classroom and this pattern uh, brought to you by Aki Quilt and Create Craft TV and me Stuart Hillard and I'll look forward to seeing you next time on another Quilting Classrooms. Remember quilters, better cuts make better quilts. See you next time. Mm -hmm.